paper and other people. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope today to add something to your discussions by outlining a little of my story, uh, my experience of poverty, uh, and the business success that relied entirely on women. Lastly, my commitment to putting my wealth to work. I then go on to consider what my latest role as the uh, first ever national ambassador for philanthropy uh, could offer this beautiful country uh, in meeting urgent needs, uh, building development, and helping towards our economic recovery. And I should be urging you to join together in some of the work that you do to unleash philanthropy, uh, but more of that later. Let me introduce myself. Um, everyone's life is in three parts. There's a sort of learning phase, uh, an earning phase, and a returning giving back. And I certainly learned a great deal in my early years uh, because I was an unaccompanied child refugee. Um, when I was five years old, uh, my mother uh, did a very brave thing and put me uh, on a train to England, what's called a kinder transport, um, into the arms of strangers, thinking never to see me again. And that letting go is something that I have learnt when I work with parents uh, of learned disabled children. But my foster, I was incredibly lucky. Uh, my foster parents brought me up as they would their own. Um, and um, thinking back, actually, Auntie was proud, we always called Martina, um, that she was very proud of being part Irish. <laughs> this business of linking to people who are not living here is quite important for your country. But I learned in those early years to cope with change and uh, to welcome that tomorrow is different from today and certainly very different from yesterday. I also learned to deal with my survivor guilt, that irrational guilt guilt of having survived when so many millions die. And um, I think I've done that by, by making each day count, uh, by uh, making my life worth saving. And finally, as a migrant, uh, I do love my adopted country with a passion that perhaps only someone who had lost their human rights can feel. Moving now to the early phase of my life, which is very feminine, I founded a 20th century cottage industry for women. Women with computer skills, uh, and that it, it started so, so small, literally on my dining room table with six pounds sterling. Um, but it eventually, after 25 years, really, uh, became large and successful. And it was a company of women a company for women, and, and I was a pathfinder in the professionalization of women, especially in the high-tech industries. And for years, I was the first woman this, the only woman that. The more I hope than a token woman, uh, because looking back, I see a clear link between the practical advancement of women uh, and the work of women philanthropists. In those days, it was a long time ago, but nobody really expected much from women at work or in society. Uh, and I, I couldn't accept that. Um, so I started challenging the current conventions of the time. Even adopting the name Steve in my business development efforts. Um, so to get through the door before anyone realized that he was she. I want it opportunities for women. And I recruited professionally qualified women, and we all have to be educated and become uh, professionally qualified, who had left the computer industry on marriage or on the birth of their first child, uh, and uh, I structured them into a home working organization. And it started on my own table, my little cottage with Belgium, it seems, I think I had four people working there at one time. 
that, you know, literally in the spare bedroom and files on top of the piano and stuff like that. Uh, but eventually it grew to be very professional and when it was acquired, 45 years later, it employed eight and a half thousand people. So it really became corporate and solid. But its story was quite an interesting one. Uh, 13 years, it's quite a long time in the life of a young company, 13 years after it started, there was equal legis opportunity legislation came in in Britain and it was no longer possible to do that positive discrimination for women and we had to start employing the men if they were good enough. <laughs> it was like, basically it was a way of giving, uh, giving to women. But given that history, you'll not be surprised that I do believe that investing in women and girls provides real tangible benefits. Not just for those individuals, but for their families, uh, their communities, and their nations. And that's especially important in today's economic times. All too often, women find ourselves at the bottom of the heap. And poverty faces many women, but does not stop them putting resources to good use whenever and wherever they can, whether it's starting in small businesses or in the education of children. We know that uh, from the impact of innovations such as microcredit, and we've seen that um, what the education of girls can produce. And we know that as the wealth of women rises, the extra money is spent well on housing, health care, clean water, and better food for the family. If one can generalize about our gender, we do not waste, whether it's money, resources, or time. And instead we work, we save, and we invest for the future. And if the world wants development, equity, and sustained growth, investing in women gives great returns. <laughs>